Thank you, sir. Thank you for inviting me here, Dr. Maini, Dr. Vaishya. And I see some of my mentors here. We got Dr. Dhami here, Dr. Jain is not here. They are all responsible for uh, setting me on this path of IGO. So thank you once again. And uh, I'll try to start the basics, which is talking about setting the stage, that is research questions and hypotheses. So if you don't start well, you don't end well. That's the belief that we must start with. So in the, uh, to introduce myself, I'm an orthopedic surgeon, but I don't do orthopedics anymore, at least for the time being. I don't know how long I can sustain it, but I don't do orthopedics anymore. I work in engineering and industrial services in research and development of medical devices with TCS. The old scientific method was to do extensive experimentation. Today we jump to getting patents. So there is a difference in the way we look at research now, and we uh, with due respect, we don't publish to perish, we publish to prosper. So we research to prosper, we publish to prosper, and that only comes with good research. And that comes with research which makes a difference, and that part of it is what is difficult. So why do I want to do research? The answer to a difficulty lies at a higher level than our usual thinking, and so we have to seek that loftier level. You need something different from your routine, you need to get something more meaningful out of your work, out of what you are perceiving from your work. And that loftier level is what we are trying to reach when we do some research and try to publish it. Some may think that the goal of my department is to publish as many papers as possible in a given time, whereas others talk about nurturing the faculty to do something meaningful and become good scientists and good human beings. I prefer the second aspect. And that's where we should be going. So what is the problem that I want to study? I need to understand the domain. Am I dealing with arthroplasty? Am I dealing with spine? Do I want to look at the foot? Do I want to look at a child which I'm treating? Something that I am comfortable to deal with. What the subject in that area which I want to tackle and what population I want to tackle. That's the basic premise from where you start. And to reach there, you need to do a literature review. You need to isolate and define your sample population then understand what is not known about it. I'm not going to sit in this day and age and try to understand the benefits of K-nailing in femur. So it, something has to be relevant to today. Something has to be, some lacunae have to be there in the understanding or some refinement has to be there to the understanding for it to be fit to be a question for study. And most important, you need an inherent curiosity in yourself and in your team to bring a new dimension to that issue. That's when you start. So the interest, what do you mean by interest when you define a scientific problem? It means the increase in knowledge expected from that study. What is easy, that is your low-hanging fruit, will not give you too much. It may be easy, it may be good for your MBBS student, for your postgraduate student, but don't expect too much out of that. So the low-hanging fruit does not give you too much gain. But if you have a very difficult problem, which is very complex, very difficult to handle, then you, require, then you can expect less tangible returns out of it. Somewhere in between is where you stand to gain. Too many variables, too difficult a problem, your study goes to 10 years. So you have to define the problem in that manner. Feasibility is something we have to understand. Do you have the finances? Do you have the resources? You can't plan a pet study in your hospital without having a pet scan in your hospital, right? So that kind of thing. The amount of time that you're anticipating, that also comes in feasibility. And also the skills of the people that you have. Do you have the skill to perform that surgery and to conduct a study on that surgery? Do you have that background? Or does somebody in your team have that background? These are the things that you need to look. And very often, what looks easy on paper is very hard to execute when it comes to a study. When you're talking over a drink or a cup of coffee, it sounds very simple. When you put it on on paper, it's not so simple. And if you define a hard problem, it may be often impossible to execute. So it's best to keep all this in mind. So we talk about feasibility as time available and resources available, interesting as significant contribution to knowledge. Now, what is the level of capability when you give a research subject to somebody, if you have an undergraduate student, easy subject, short time, 
not necessarily. One of my undergraduate uh, students did a paper which got published in the Indian Journal of Rheumatology on neuropathic aspects of osteoarthritic pain. It was done in three months. It wasn't an easy topic, but he executed it. A graduate student requires more difficulty, whereas a PhD student has a definite goal in that thesis. His topics are more complex, have to be more original. And you as a full-time researcher can afford to spend five years on a topic, six years on a topic, on a research subject. So some of your research subjects you can tailor in that way. <clears throat> so what happens when you give yourself a research question, a direction, you know where you're going, you're focused as to what you're studying, you have a tangible objective, you have aims, you have definite variables you want to analyze, and you get the motivation to do it and a sense of purpose. That's where we start. Many of us make a mistake that we don't start with a question. Even I have. So what are the attributes of a suitable research question? It should be clear. It should be easy to understand. It should be focused, that is to be narrow enough to be answered thoroughly in that period of time in which you're doing your research. It should be concise. It should not be a paragraph. It's usually a sentence or two sentences. It is not answerable as a yes or no. You need to go through some methodology to arrive at that conclusion. And lastly, it is arguable. It's open to debate and rebuttal. That should definitely be an aspect of your research question. How do you start a general topic? I want to study knee replacement. Do some preliminary research on that, on the basis of what you are seeing in your patient population. Start asking questions, discuss with your colleagues. That part of it is difficult, because you always think you are right. But when you discuss, you realize where you are wrong. Evaluate your questions and formulate your hypothesis. We'll go through each step. So when you look at a study question, it need not be black and white. When I look at an outcome of a particular type of knee, it need not be black and white. It does not mean just the outcome. I may think of different aspects as difficulty of surgical technique, I may think of blood loss, I may think of time taken to rehabilitation, everything may be difficult. These are secondary questions. Some of them, as you see the upward curve here, may lead you to your path. Others may distract you from your path. So you have to sec select your secondary questions accordingly. Those which are in line of your research, you pick up. Those which are adding significant information, pick up. Rest you discard. But questions definitely will arise. Now, what's the difference between the question and the hypothesis? That's the research question which we just discussed. The fundamental, fundamental aspect of your research, which determines the methodology and nature of research, starts with interest, gets refined to a workable goal. It is clear, relevant, manageable, interesting, and usually original. Whereas your hypothesis is a statement about possible conclusions that is scientifically tested for its validity and reference. This is what you are actually going to do, is your hypothesis. Your question is one step below that. It's formulated on the basis of study which you do, an analysis of relation of variables which you are going to construct on the basis of that study. So a good hypothesis must necessarily be based on a good research question and it must drive your data collection. These are fundamentals. It's now looking at the question, the question I asked is the alignment in robotic assisted knee replacement any better than computer navigated knee replacement? And what's the difference in outcomes between uh, CAS replacement and robotic assisted replacement. They're simple questions. But if I have to frame them into a hypothesis, I would put it as robotic assisted knee replacement leads to better alignment than computer navigated knee replacement, one. Or I would like to put it as uh, robotic assisted knee replacement gives better functional outcomes than computer navigated knee replacement. But for the purpose of statistical differences, one needs to express these as a null hypothesis and a alternate hypothesis. And in that case, I would say as an alternate hypothesis is the positive that there is a better alignment and functional outcome with robotic assisted knee replacement. As a null, I would say it does not lead to better alignment and better outcomes. So I would disprove the null hypothesis to accept the alternate hypothesis in the course of my study in my conclusions, or I would prove the null hypothesis to reject the alternate hypothesis. Right? So that's where you develop from the question. Now there are certain criteria which are described, what is known as the finer criteria, that is feasibility, that you have adequate number of subjects, adequate technical expertise, affordable in time and money, manageable in scope. Second is interesting. Third, it is novel. 
it is ethical, and it is relevant. These are expressed as the finer criteria, and it is good to remember these. It gives you a guidance, and as you keep doing more, it becomes a sort of a pattern, and you do it automatically. Why would add one more R here? I feel that everything should be reproducible, that if I ask somebody else yeah. to do it, it should be reproducible. Another criterion which is described is the PICO criteria, which is actually P-I-C-O, to which Bhandari added T, so which means population of interest P, intervention, that is the exposure or the intervention that you do, the control is the standard of care against which you compare, your outcome of interest, and the time. So I have sourced these from these references and a little bit of experience too. And uh, we'll exercise the gray cells a little bit, right? So we'll take a paper first, which uh, I have read earlier. This is the paper published in the Clinical Orthopedics and Re Related Research, which is uh, Extracorporeal Irradiation and Reimplantation of Astibular Resections Resulting in Adequate Hip Function. Now, we all know about ECIR, and the author is giving the background that extracorporeal irradiation is well described in the extremity surgery, but not done with respect to pelvic surgery. And though the risk of wound complications had discouraged surgeons from using... because they knew they had the data. Is there evidence of osteonecrosis or cartilage loss? That could be taken as a secondary question. And what were the oncological outcomes after ECRT? It's a very lovely paper in which the questions are so clearly defined at the very outset of the paper. In the first two paragraphs itself, you know what to expect. And that's how it should be done, right? And coming back here, if you are in that kind of a mood, I can stop, else I can proceed. You want me to stop, fine. So that one example was enough for the day. <laughs>